Tonight, we begin with breaking news, a shooting investigation leading San, San Antonio police to two motels tonight. Yeah, that investigation spanning several hours. Police first responded to a hotel near I-10 in Wurzbach, and now this evening, they're at a Motel 6 right across the highway. The night team's Patty Santos there as well. Patty, we're hearing one person at least shot in all this. Yeah, you can see police working the scene at this Motel 6 here. This is off of Frontage Road and Warsbach. Uh, they found a man shot in the chest here, but they tell us all of this started uh, at another motel right across the street. Take a look. Officers say they were called to that motel to the shots fired at that parking lot around 4 o'clock this afternoon. Police didn't find anyone there at that time, but they say surveillance video helped them identify the suspect's car. Now, tips then eventually led officers to find a car matching that description right outside the Motel 6. The suspected driver was found in a room here, but police say it is not clear at what location that man was possibly shot. Officers are talking to people right now who were inside that room. That uh, man is being treated. And again, this is all being sorted out by police right now, but no arrests have been made. Steve Stefania. Thank you, Patty. We're also having more breaking news tonight. Officers still looking for suspects in a shooting in Leon Valley. One person taken to University Hospital. Police did not give details on the condition. Tonight's call at the Vista Del Rey Apartments marks the second shooting there in a matter of days. A man shot inside an apartment there on Sunday night. At last check, no arrests have been made in that case. In just one week, students in Uvalde are going to head back to the classroom since their school year ended in tragedy. For months, we've heard parents calling for safety and security changes. And yes, that work has started. But as the night team's Lee Waldman shows us, it's not going to be ready in time. It's a taste of what next week will hold. Math. You want to learn math? Is that one of your favorite subjects? Math, yeah. Parents and their students walking in and out of Uvalde Elementary for Meet the Teacher Night. A little more nervous than normal, but um, he's got a good teacher. Lucas Potter is going into third grade. He was at Rob on May 24th. His mom, Angela, says she'll have some fear sending him and his brother back next Tuesday. You don't think it can happen to you, and then all of a sudden it does. The campus is partially enclosed by eight foot tall, non scalable perimeter fencing. Right now, there's still a few holes that need to be filled. It's the same here at Dalton Elementary. But at Morales Junior High, no new fencing in sight. I went to Morales yesterday and they didn't have anything improved over there that I saw. This morning we made them virtual. According to the district's website, fencing work is started on three of the eight campuses. Uvalde High School will be measured and a timeline made for when their fencing will be put up. I trust this fence. It's a school board I don't trust. Meanwhile, the work on the secured vestibules at each campus is running significantly behind, according to Superintendent Dr. Hal Harrell. Only started at Uvalde Elementary, UDLA, and UHS. We'll have a DPS officer assigned at each entry point when school begins. The district bought 500 security cameras. They're fully installed at UHS and started at Morales. Nowhere else, though. Again, uh, work won't be com totally complete by Tuesday. However, we will continue this work until it is complete. With school around the corner, there's some optimism about the work that's been done. Hopefully he can feel a little more safer. And plenty of skepticism. If I have to pull on my will. And right now, only thing I see here is a fence. CISD shared that 136 students have enrolled in their virtual academy. That application process is open until tomorrow. We're waiting on transfer numbers from this school year, but looking at UCISD's data through the Texas Education Agency website in the 2021-2022 school year, there were 416 total transfers out of the district. Back to you. Lee, thank you. Meantime, now we're trying to learn more about the response to the shooting at Robb Elementary. It's been an ongoing thing. Several law enforcement agencies were there for more than an hour before taking down the shooter, as many of you know. Now, KSAT 12 joined other media outlets to obtain records from the city of Uvalde, the Uvalde County Sheriff's Office, and Uvalde CISD. And this is in addition to another lawsuit against the Texas Department of Public Safety. President Joe Biden spoke about crime and gun reform today in Pennsylvania. He says the answer is not to defund the police, but to add more money. 
He's proposing to use $37 billion to increase the number of officers in the U.S. and says that he wants to ban assault weapons. But Congress would need to play a role in that proposal. And two teenagers stabbed on the Riverwalk and police say their attacker is still on the run tonight. Now a reward of up to $5,000 could help in the case. Investigators released these photos of the man they are looking for. Officers say he's accused of stabbing the two teens near West Crockett and St. Mary Street last month. If you know who this guy is, call Crime Stoppers at 210-224-STOP. And new tonight, it is a first in years for San Antonio. Fewer animals are leaving Animal Care Services, or ACS, meaning more animals will need to be euthanized. Until now, ACS has been able to adopt, transfer, or return these animals 90% of the time. They call that the live release rate, and that rate has dropped now to 88%. ACS told City Council the economy is partly to blame. Since more people are being evicted, those people are surrendering the pets they may have. ACS says they're also dealing with staffing shortages. The rising cost to spay and neuter also a problem. Keeping that population down is going to be the solution you know, in the future to having too many animals in San Antonio, which leads to too many animals at homes, which leads to too many animals on the street. ACS asking the city for more money to create 14 more positions. They say they're also working on a strategic plan to rethink the way it does business. Details of that plan will be released to the council in the fall. It nearly ended. The legal team from Michelle Barrientes Vela pushed for a mistrial six days into testimony. In this case, the ex-constables accused of fabricating security payment logs for Rodriguez Park. Now, a Texas Ranger investigating the case went beyond that scope during his testimony today. At one point, he said he believed that the ex-constable committed official oppression, something that Barrientes Vela wasn't charged with in this trial, a comment that Barrientes Vela's team reacted to. This is ridiculous. I mean, we were clear about this. We had hearings outside the jury's presence multiple times. She's asking a question about what offense is, and then he bites for it. They knew it. They knew they were going to do this. There's no other explanation. These are not stupid people. They knew exactly what was going on. You were more than fair and more than clear of your admonishments not to talk about anything outside the motion and limiting. Clear. Now, Judge Belia Mesa denied the motion for mistrial, but she ordered the Texas Ranger to attend another hearing to demonstrate why he was not in contempt of court. The prosecution, though, nearing the end of this case, defense attorneys for Barrientes Vela have not indicated if they plan to call witnesses. Now for a look at your headlines in your night beat news flash. Both Pfizer and Moderna hoping for emergency approval of their new booster shots this week. The CDC's advisory committee is set to discuss the shots on Thursday. The shots are formulated to protect against the new Omicron strains and the original strain. The FDA also has to give its approval. A vote on emergency approval could happen by the end of the week. There are renewed concerns about the potent drug fentanyl. Amount as small as the tip of a pencil could be deadly. Now, rainbow fentanyl could be a disturbing trend on campus. The drugs look like candy. People think they're getting Xanax or Adderall off the street and unknowingly take fentanyl. Between Austin and New Braunfels, the Hayes County Independent Schools District suspects the drug led to three student deaths in just the past month there. San Antonio area districts we spoke to say they haven't seen this at their schools, but it's certainly on their radar. Big bucks, big ideas. What about the big decision? We're talking about the $50 million in extra revenue CPS Energy paid to the city. Several council members seem to be backing away from giving customers that $29 credit on their October bill. Instead, some council members talked about using the money for weatherization. Mayor Ron Nuremberg is backing a rebate, but it's open to other options as long as there's an effective plan to go with it. Next, week vote, next week's vote is now being delayed to allow council members to discuss the ultimate decision. And that's a look at your night beat news flash. And we have modified rain chances a little bit. I do anticipate more drought denting rain. The timing, though, may not be optimal for everybody. We'll get into those uh, details in a bit. Also remaining very humid in the days ahead. Wait till you see how much rain fell just within the past 24 hours across our, our area. I'll tell you which neighborhoods and which parts of south and central Texas really cashed in. And when we're most likely to see more numerous showers in just a bit.
Adam, thank you. Coming up now, a controversial Texas law now being tested. Why one school district is denying a donation of signs that lawmakers say must be accepted. And guns, drugs, and cash seized inside the San Antonio home. Police also ended up making several arrests. So how can San Antonio's DART team help clean up other neighborhoods? We break it all down next on The Night Beat. Tonight, relief for one San Antonio neighborhood. Police found guns, drugs, and then arrested three people at a home on Creekmore Drive that's on the city's east side. And the city's dangerous assessment response team helped make that bust. So here's a question. How do they tackle problem properties? The night team's John Paul Barajas tells us that the plan involves neighbors who are persistent. Because eventually these little kids are going to grow up and and they're going to see drugs all over, you know. So them getting rid of the problem is best for everyone. It's high praise for San Antonio's Dangerous Assessment Response Team, or DART. Deputy City Attorney Joe Nino explained what Roman Sandoval and his neighbors were subjected to leading up to a bust at a nearby home. You had everything from shots being fired at the location, narcotics being uh, dealt at the location, uh, multiple family disturbances. We have prostitution coming out of there. It's a perfect example of what the multi-agency team looks for, but executing a search warrant at a private or commercial property isn't that simple. There has to be a history of criminal or code violations for at least two years. That includes complaint calls, police reports, or calls to 311. We go to court, uh, a judge or jury is going to have to determine that this property is a nuisance. Uh, which means they're going to have to have a documented history. For some, the two-year minimum wait may seem excessive. Some people will view us as, you know, doing the job. Um, others might say it should have been done a long time ago. The deputy city attorney tells us it's not that properties won't face consequences for two years. They'll still have to answer to day-to-day -day calls. But if things don't improve... The DART team is here to address the worst of the worst nuisance properties. It is here to make the city a better place to live. I should probably start paying more attention, you know, and like, you know, I, I would like to help for sure. In this case, persistence pays off. If you see something, report it. That way there's documentation of it. As for the DART unit, they've been operating since 2007. We're told they usually hit 40 to 50 locations a year, and we're on pace for that average again this year. John Paul Barajas, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, John Paul. A Texas law now being called into question. That law says schools must display signs with the words in God we trust if those signs are donated. Last night, neighbors donated their own signs to a North Texas school district, but those signs were rejected. They presented the Carroll ISD school board with the signs in colors representing the LGBTQ flags and a sign in Arabic. It's very frustrating that we are being uh, excluded uh, intentionally uh, by our schools, and that's why um, it, it's very frustrating for us. Just two weeks ago, the district accepted a donation of signs from a self-proclaimed Christian conservative cell phone provider. So why did they deny the donation made yesterday? Well, the district says they don't have to accept more than one copy of the sign. That isn't what the law says, by the way. That's their interpretation of it. It's not clear if this will lead to a legal battle in courts but I'm betting it will. Take two. Artemis One is going to get a second chance at launching this weekend. NASA's planning to make its next attempt Saturday afternoon. As you know, yesterday's launch was canceled because of a faulty sensor and engine issues. And when it does launch, the uncrewed mission is going to serve as NASA's first step toward returning to the moon. The mission could also help with future visits to Mars. All right, let's take a live look with live cam outside. And today was one of those days where it seems like more parts of our viewing area got some rain. They did, just not where most of us not live. Not where most of us <laughs> live, but I'm hoping it'll, like I said yet last night, I'm hoping it'll all even out in the long run. I do think in the long run it will in this kind of a weather pattern because we have so many opportunities and we have fine-tuned the rain chances a bit more. I actually dropped them a bit for the next couple of days, down to 30%, so just very isolated in nature. You know, just a few popping up here and there very far apart in the afternoons. But then by Friday, raising them back up through the weekend and especially spiking on Sunday. And of course, there's still a lot of time between now 
and Sunday, but it does look like overall the pattern is going to be more favorable to help develop more numerous showers and thunderstorms at times over this upcoming holiday weekend. I know being Labor Day weekend may not be the most optimal time, but it's not like it's going to you know, be raining the entire time. You'll still be able to get outside and uh, enjoy some outdoor activities and then enjoy some soaking rain here and there. All right, let's take a look at the radar. This is all that's left over northwest of San Antonio, Kerr County up I-10. Just a little bit. And this was some really rocking and rolling heavy rainfall earlier today. We even had a flash flood warning earlier this evening that expired at 9 p.m. in Bandera County as a result of what was much heavier rain. Now take a look at the 24 hour rainfall totals, particularly this morning west of San Antonio, Del Rio, down to Kamado, Eagle Pass, Northern Maverick County. We had some flash flooding even up near Brackettville. These rainfall estimates by the Doppler radar, I mean, are on the order of seven to eight inches in parts of Northern Eagle Pass where you saw the purple colors. Locally, little different story. It's really mostly outside of San Antonio and Bear County. You get into Bandera County, close to Vanderpool, between Tuff and Vanderpool, 7.3 inches estimated by the Doppler radar right there in Bandera County. You look at San Antonio and Wilson County had some good rain, the yellow indicating over two inches, just down 181 before you get to Floresville. Within Bear County, nothing on the north side of town today. Decent amounts along 1604 on the far south side, and that's where we had estimates of one to two inches and even close to shirts right along 1604 there on the northeast side of town. So obviously very different all across our area, but overall the coverage was pretty good for the rainfall. Uh, this is actually a photo we got from southern Bear County south of 1604. It's hard to see, but right there, one and a half inches confirmed in the rain gauge. So here's our overall pattern and there's an upper level swirl, this counterclockwise swirl, a disturbance that's overhead. It's drifting westward, so it looks like it's going to take its energy westward with it here for a few days, but for early tomorrow for the morning commute again, there should be enough energy west of Highway 83. We're talking closer to the Rio Grande to develop more downpours for the morning hours. Again, that's west of San Antonio, closer to the Rio Grande and then into the afternoon. Like I was saying, just very widely spaced pop up little showers and isolated downpours here and there, but not very much in terms of coverage for the next couple of days. 90. That was our high temperature today. Four degrees below average. The record 103 set back in 1901. We're 77 now in Pleasanton, 78 New Braunfels, 79 in San Antonio, and temperatures really just dropping a few degrees from here on out. About 76 tomorrow morning with those border showers, and then a 30% chance as we get into the afternoon. So not a whole lot of coverage of those pop up showers. Low 90s for high temperatures. I think 93 downtown and in, in San Antonio, 91 Castroville and 88 Bulverde. Then near 90 this weekend as we will fine tune the specifics of the rainfall for the holiday weekend in the days ahead. All right. Thank you, Adam. Hello, Greg. Hello there. All right, so it was cut day. Any surprises? Yeah, actually, there are quite a few to me, especially on the Cowboys and the Texans. And one move the Cowboys did make, which was kind of a surprise. When we come back, it is cut down day. Get down to that 53-man roster. That guy is not on the team right now. But will he be back is a big question. And high school volleyball tonight coming up. Pro football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. Dallas Cowboys release both Cooper Rush and Will Greer, leaving Dak Prescott as the only quarterback on the team at this point. Although most of us feel one of them will be back with the team in some form, right? That's after the Cowboys had already released backup quarterback Ben DiNucci prior to today. But what was interesting, the Cowboys did not place Michael Gallup on the pup list, meaning they expect him back before the fourth game of the season, if not sooner. The real games begin. I mean, we got Tampa Bay coming in here in two weeks and you know, and we got to do whatever it takes, you know, run, pass, taking care of the ball, taking it away, you know, big play opportunities, you know, all the things that, that, that come into winning football. So it's time to put it all together. Um, training camp has gone fast. I don't know if the traveling, you know, being on, being on the road there for two weeks made it go quicker. But, um, you know, I can't, I can't, I feel like I just left for Oxford and now we're back and we're getting ready to go. So, um, but we're ready. It's been a very, very productive training camp. All right, and another kind of a surprise, he got also waived, if you will, Brett Maher, the only kicker on the team, but also we expect him back in some form or fashion. The Houston Texans also released quarterback Jeff Driscoll today after he fell behind former commanders and Aggies quarterback Kyle Allen. He's part of the Texans' cuts to get down to that 53-man roster. That's after he signed a one-year deal to be with Houston, even though he can be brought back on the practice squad. 
It is difficult, but to me, in the end, there aren't hard decisions to make. Um, it's a hard decision if we start making those decisions at the start of training camp, but now we've gone through all season, training camp, preseason. Now we're going to uh, we'll make inform an informed decision based on all the information you can get, and I'm excited about where I think we'll end. All right, another surprise on the Texans cuts is right there, the running back, Marlon Mack, the veteran. They cut him. That kind of means, we think, that Damian Pierce, a rookie, will be their starter on opening day. When the UTSA Roadrunners kicked off their 2022 season this Saturday in the Alamo Dome, the Roadrunners were encouraging fans to get to their seats a little early. That's so they can see the unveiling of the Conference USA Championship banner in the rafters of the Alamo Dome. The Roadrunners are coming off their best football season in school history with their 12-win season, and they begin to fence their title against the University of Houston. What is the vibe like right now on game week? We have a saying that, you know, it doesn't matter who we're playing. And we're always trying to prepare the best we can and focus on us and getting getting ready to play. But obviously, game week, there's a little bit more of that energy you feel that, uh, you know, amongst the team. But, you know, we're excited. We're excited. We're flying around, making plays, and we're just getting better each and every day um, leading up to the game. I feel like everybody was juiced up. I feel like, I hate saying it, but just it was from everybody it was just a little bit different because I feel like everybody was more locked in compared to like a regular past week in, our, in fall camp. We're pretty locked into our fall camp, but just a game week just is is a little different all right kickoff in the alamo dome on saturday is set for 2 30 p.m back-to-back -back big games of the jets and rockets coming up next one of the big games that are big game coverage this Friday night will be the Justin Rockets hosting the Westlake Chaparrales out of Austin. The Rockets are coming off their season opening 46-43 overtime victory against Johnson, the KSAC Pigskin Classic 2022 in the Alamo Dome this past Saturday. Looking forward to hosting one of the premier teams in the state this coming Friday night. This after Austin Westlake defeated Ridge Point 44-14 in their season opener. I know they're real good in the box. The O-line and D-line is real, real makes that team. So our O-line and D-line got to step up in. The skills got to make plays when the plays are needed to be made. We know they're a great team. They, Everybody knows who they are. We're the underdogs, most definitely. But like Coach told us today, we worry about ourselves and we'll get the job done. All right, kick out between Judson and Austin Westlake at Rutledge Stadium will be on Friday at 7 p.m. Heavyweight battle at Paul Taylor Fieldhouse tonight. District 29-6A O'Connor taking on Harlan. Panthers in control early. Nevaeh Smith with a cross-court kill. O.C. leads 17-8. Hawks rally back here. Anaya Joseph hammers a shot down the line. Harlan cuts that deficit all the way down to 3, 23-20. But O'Connor closes it out. Kelly Fording spikes it home. Panthers win the set 25-20. Sweep the Hawks three sets to none. Great Battle in Carnerward High School. Shamrocks hosting Kerrville Tivy. Antlers up by a set, but trailing late in the second. Carolyn Dial goes to the sharp angle kill. It drops in as the cheerleader arrives on the sidelines. Tivy pulls within one, but the Shamrocks close out the set. Gianna Hilliard hammers one down the back line. Carnet Word ties it up at one set apiece, but they fall to the Antlers three sets to two. Last stop of the night, Southwest Legacy hosting Kennedy. Rockets rallying from a huge deficit in the first set. Better so, Trigo finds Ebony Rahino for a shot down the line. Kennedy on a 7-0 run. They leave 23-22, but the Titans come through in the clutch. Abigail Soto hits it off the block and down. Legacy wins a seesaw set 26-24. Take the match three sets to none. More highlights right now at ksat.com. Thank you, Greg. Andrew Seeley was everywhere tonight. Yes, he was. <laughs> Very busy guy. Yes. We're back in two minutes. Ooh, we have seen your posts out there. We've seen you share pictures of your pumpkin spice <laughs> drinks, but check that out. You know what that is? All right. A Nebraska man hollowed out a giant pumpkin and used it as a boat, a boat on the Missouri River. Dwayne Hansen right there was set on breaking a Guinness World Record. He did it, paddling down for 38 miles. The last record, by the way, was 25. Hansen says that he grew the 864-pound pumpkin and named it Berta. That's a guy who's really into pumpkins. You would say. It's a, it's a pumpkin spice flotte. Oh, <laughs> you, <laughs> Steve. <laughs> Well, that does it for us here. He had to get a that, pun in. That, that, that boat is gorgeous.